Good morning, church. It's good to see you. It's good to be able to worship together this morning. If you're glad to come to worship this morning, will you say amen? amen. So good to be able to worship together, to be the body of Christ as we meet. And we want to always remember those that are not able to come right now that are watching. And uh, we're thinking of you as well. Well, this is a, 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 just a wonderful time to refresh um, our walk with Christ, to, to renew um, our relationship with Jesus, and to continue the fellowship that we have with one another. I, I've talked to so many people that have said that there's nothing like the fellowship of the church to, to spur us on, to, to help us to stay aflame, and to keep walking with Christ. And so what a privilege it is, and really... This is a good time to, to look at that fellowship um, and think about how important it is and to be thankful for it, right? Because there's been times when it's been threatened to be taken away. And so now we, as we're able to meet together, what a privilege and what, a, what an awesome piece of grace it is. Well, I've got some announcements for you this morning. Uh, if you're new here, we're so glad you're here. And we want to ask you to fill something out for us. If you would do that, that'd be great. There's a communication card in the pew in front of you. If it just take that out and fill it out and then leave it in the pew, we'll go ahead and collect it. And we'd love to be able to contact you and get to know you a little bit better that way. Also, we'd love it if you could go back to the welcome booth. If you haven't already, we have a gift for you. And uh, the people in the welcome booth are great. They're there to help uh, tell you a little bit about the church and about what's going on and, and what kinds of ministries we have. So that's a great way to get a really quick uh, insight into where we are at as a church. Well, uh, for this morning's service, the ushers will begin to dismiss us row by row from the back at the end, and so we'd ask the people in the front to just wait until that's done. We'll sing an extra verse um, so that that can happen, but if the people in the back could just wait till they're dismissed, we'd sure appreciate that. We're, we're just trying to do that for safety and making sure that everybody's comfortable with um, exiting the church. And we have coming up the men's camp. September 11th through the 13th. The cost for men is $45, which is a great price for a three-day retreat. Um, and there's information and registration brochures at the information booth. Go ahead and take a look at that. Time is running down, so this is the time to go ahead and register. If you haven't registered today, this will be a great time to go ahead and lock yourself in and get yourself registered for it. I do want to say uh, it's a great privilege to be able to go to men's camp because there's so many things camps that have been canceled. So this would be a great time if, you, if you've been kind of pent up this summer and haven't gotten to do a lot of things, men, then this is a great time to go do it. Get out in the woods, get out with other men in fellowship, um, learn more about uh, co being courageous in Christ. That's our theme is courageous. So being a courageous Christian, um, it's just going to be a wonderful time. So I want to encourage you to think about uh, attending this. Unfortunately, the fall women's retreat is going to be canceled, and so it's postponed until spring. So maybe we shouldn't look at it as a cancellation, just a postponement. It's going to happen, but in spring, definitely want to make that happen. Um, and so the new date information will be coming soon. So please just be aware of that and, and, and keep note. Well, after church and Sunday school this, this day, um, we're going to be having a WANA informational meeting. We will be having Awana starting next month, and so there's an informational meeting for anyone who is interested in being a helper. If you're interested in being a helper, come and, 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 and learn about the, the program. And actually, there's lunch provided, so there's a great lunch provided, and families are welcome. So if you're here, you're interested in Awana, and you're thinking, what are we going to do with the whole family? We'll bring them and feed them. It's going to be great. So this is going to be right after the Sunday school service. Sunday school, it's going to be downstairs in the fellowship hall. Well, um, so thankful for your, your tithes, your offerings um, through this time. Um, I'm just overwhelmed by the amount of giving that you have done. And just talking to other churches, that's not always the case. And so thank you so much for giving. Uh, but as you know, we don't pass the plate at this time uh, to receive that. There's a box in the foyer. It's, it's a big, huge box. You can't miss it. And so it's right back there, and uh, that's a good way to contribute. For more information, please take a look at your bulletin. Uh, we have uh, provided a lot of information there for you to take a look at. Now, as we continue our worship this morning, I want to um, invite you to pray. And, you know, that's what we do in uh, difficult times, right? Whenever we have a difficult time as a believer, what should we do? We should turn to the Lord in prayer because we want to, to ask God to move in our land. We want to ask God to, to glorify himself. 
to, to magnify that scripture that says that not, not glory to us, Lord, but glory to your name, glory to you. And so we want to pray in that, in that vein that God would be glorified in our land, in our church, in our area, and that he would make himself known and that we may be the tools to do that. Amen? Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we come to you and we acknowledge your word that shows us that you, above all things, are seeking your glory. And that this is a wonderful, hopeful thing because we know that your glory includes our redemption. That, that part of your glory is that you have made us a people, saved by grace through faith, justified, sanctified, and glorified in Christ alone. And so we want to glorify you, Lord. And as we are a people who are looking for answers right now, as we are a people who are um, seeing the struggle around us, whether it be um, pestilence, whether it be unrest, whether it be natural disasters, whatever is happening right now, and they are all happening as you know, Lord, that we will seek your face and your face alone, that we will turn to you and ask you to guide us as a people. Lord, we humble ourselves before you, realizing that we can't fix these problems. You can. You are the great I am. You are the Lord of the universe. You are the one who has made all of these things, and they are yours. This is your world, Lord. And so we look to you and we say, Lord, we beseech you to work in our hearts. We beseech you to, to change us, to conform us to the image of Christ, that we may be Christ image bearers in this world, that we may be people who others stand up and take notice that there is Christ in us and they want to see Christ. We pray, Lord, and beseech you that you would work within the higher levels of, of government and the decision-making in this country, Lord, that your will would be done and that you would even take what people mean for evil and turn it to good. Lord, we pray for those who have governance over us, Lord. We pray that they would humble themselves before you, that they would have your wisdom, that they would have your guidance. And Lord, they would acknowledge that they are not the great powers, Lord, but every power they have has been given to them by you. And Lord, we pray for our community. We pray for, for the hurting and the lost. We pray, Lord, that you would um, shine the light of your glory into their lives through the gospel of Jesus, that that this would be the salve that heals the wound that is caused by sin in their lives. Lord, we are surrounded by people who are your creation, who have turned from you and are desperately lost in their own wickedness and destined for hell. Lord, let that truth impact us and not leave us cold and indifferent, but I pray, Lord, it gives us a compassion that Jesus showed us. So, Lord, we want to pray for all these things and we want, to, we want to ask you to glorify yourself in our lives. That we would be those who have the only goal to bring glory to your name. And we pray this in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? Let's say the address, then the verse, then the address. Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Micah 6, 8. Please remain standing. Good morning. Let's sing together, Rock of Ages.
we're going to be reading together from Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. Let's read these words together. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 38 and 39. And I'm, we're going to be singing a new song today that was inspired by these words. And so I'll sing the first verse in the chorus, and then we'll sing the first verse and chorus again together.
please be seated. Well, let me ask you a question as we begin this morning. Would you rather have $80,000 or would you rather have $100,000? Not a trick question. What would you like? What would you prefer? 100. It's not that difficult. But in my preparation for our message today in Philippians, it's kind of a continuation of our message last week. It's part B. Uh, I ran across uh, a study that was shared, and, and it was interesting because the study was a group, one group was asked, would you rather make $100,000, but you also knew that all of those around you were making $125,000? Or would you rather make $80,000 and know that you were making more than all of those around you? And it was shocking the number of people who said, I'd rather make 80. There's something about us, our, our natural person, that, that I want this, but I really want this if it's more than you. That, that's, that's envy, that's pride. It's what we wrestle with, and it's, it's what Paul was speaking into when he was spoken to the, the church in Philippi, he was talking into a church that was full of pride, of envy, reflected on, on his words where he says, live a life man, worthy of the manner of Christ. I just, wanted to have, I just wish you would have said, stop it. Stop arguing, stop complaining, stop fighting. Your lives are betraying the gospel. And what was the source of that? I'd rather make 80 if it's more than you, if it's more than others. It's kind of sourced in that. Uh, last week we talked about just that, remembering what was at stake, remembering uh, Paul was challenging them when their lives were not measured up to the gospel that they were sharing. He said, remember what's at stake. Live a life worthy of the manner of Christ. And he also talked about Pressure. He talked about um, what they had been given. And then finally, he's, he's, he calls upon them. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit, because they were doing them out of uh, selfishness and conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. And that's a message we hear a lot in the church and as we read the Word. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. He told them what to do, but the question was, but how am I going to do that? Where is that going to come from? See, it's easier to say that than to do it. It was easier for the Philippians to hear it than to walk it, and the same for us. Remember, the context of Philippi was, this was formerly a military outpost of, of Rome. It's it's where Octavian had defeated Brutus, and it was military. And so over the years, many of the people living there were, were uh, military who, uh, who had um, uh, retired. And so just all of the pride, the honor that made up Rome was displayed within the city. And that's the context that Paul was speaking into. He was speaking into a church full of conflict, and we have conflict, have it in our church, in our home, in our families. But conflict can be okay if it's something that we can come back and deal with and resolve. But he was speaking into a conflict that was long-lasting, ongoing, destructive. He speaks into it and challenges them to have a mindset of humility, reflective of the generous message of Christ. So today we're going to the message is, is kind of contrasting this mindset of, of Philippi, of pride, and the mindset of Christ. 
Pride. <laughs> Pride's one of the seven deadly sins, right? Maybe it's the source of the other six. There's some debate about that. Pride is, they did this. They won't do this. Pride exalts myself. It's all about me. And, and pride forgets about others. And it forgets about God. It was important to Paul to speak into this. And, and just briefly thinking about pride, let us not ignore or underestimate the damage that pride can have. It's destructive. It can pull families apart. It can pull relationships apart. If you take just a little bit of time, I'm sure you can think even now of examples of that in your circles. But also let us not ignore the power of humility to heal. The destruction of pride and the humility to heal. It's with this goal in mind, the power of humility, looking to the interests of others, that Paul speaks into the church. And he gives them an example of humility. If I see it, if I understand it, if I can picture it, then maybe I understand how I can put that on for myself. So I'm going to read for you our passage today is in Philippians, it's chapter 2, beginning with verse 5. Here's how Paul continues from last week. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was born in the form of God, did not, account, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let me read a quote to you from uh, one of the commentaries, uh, Homer Kent, that I read. He said, The great example of humility is Christ Jesus. Although verses 5 to 11 contain one of the outstanding Christologies of the New Testament, and it does, these verses were written to illustrate the point of humility and selflessness. The literary form of this beautiful passage leads many to regard it as an early Christian hymn. He says two things. The point of this is not to the, expound on the doctrine of Christology, but to focus on Christ's humility. That's the point of this passage. And it was written in such a way that it leads many to think that it was a, a, a Christian hymn at the time. It, it, it was a song or a poem. And in our walkthrough in, in, in Sunday school, we're using all sorts of memory tools. And I just thought of immediately, just wow, wow, to take all the wealth and depth of what it has to say about Christ and put that into a song that people would sing and repeat when they didn't have the written word to grasp and recall, and hold on to that. And so I'm going to pick up on that idea of, of a song today uh, in, my, in my outline you'll see in just a few moments. But as we go on, verse 5 says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. In the NIV it reads, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. You're going to solve the relationship issues? Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. This is a call to change how we think. It's, it's a call to change and to think as Jesus thinks. This is written to, by Paul to the church, but is this not very applicable to us in our relationships? 
Do we not have challenges? And this is a message for all of us, and it can impact our homes, our workplace, our relationships. And I promise you, we all have relationships that could use this message and apply it to it. So the first part, verses 6 and 7, is the song of humility. Let's read that. Have this mind among yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, verse 5, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but in contrast, emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And there is a lot, a lot there. Simply put, Christ, while retaining the essence of God, also became human. In his incarnation, he was fully God and fully man at the same time. God manifest in human flesh. John 1.14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Though fully God, fully man, may be challenges for us to get our heads around, and grasp, we want to grasp the humility of these verses. That's the key point. Let me quote John MacArthur, and I'm sorry, but, but this is so... I, I like the way he said this. In light of the profound reality of Jesus' full and uncompromised deity, his incarnation, his becoming man, was the most profound possible humiliation. For him to change in any way or any degree, even temporary, by the divine decree of the Father, required descent. Without forsaking or in any way diminishing his perfect deity or his absolute holiness in a way that is far beyond human comprehension. The creator took on the form of the created. The infinite became finite. The sinless took on sin upon himself. The very heart of the gospel of redemption is that the Father made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Paul sought for the Philippians to grasp the humility of Christ as he took on the form of the created. In that day, humility, humbleness, was not looked upon well. It was the lowest of the low. It was weakness. But I say today, I think maybe we view it a little bit differently. We recognize extreme pride and we kind of shy away from it. And, and when we see true humble spirit, we're kind of drawn to that and, and appreciate it. Humility is not a weakness. Uh, one man says it this way, Humility is a noble choice to forego status, to deploy your resources, or use your influence for the good of others before yourself. And that's exactly what Christ did. He forgo his status, he deployed his resources, and he used all that he could for others. This is the new song that Paul's speaking to the Philippians about. You've been hearing this song of pride. Let me share with you a new song that needs to be your song. And it begins with a song of humility. Humility is not the absence of power, but it's the use of power in the service of others. Oh Lord, how can I use my wealth? How can I use my position? How can I use my experience? How can I use whatever I have in the service of others? It seems for us today, humility is... Humility is easier to see and grasp and accept, but that's not the way it was at that time, not in Roman culture. In Roman, Greek and Roman culture, this thing called uh, philotimia, literally the love of honor. And the pursuit of honor, tangible or intangible, was a constant pursuit. They, you were asked, where did you live? What was your family's name? How many slaves do you have? How many servants do you have? And all of that 
elevated your status. And then as you grew, you, you continued to do all you could. You wanted to marry right. You wanted to have the right friends and connections. If you gave, you gave only if it was recognized it would elevate your status. That was the environment. All was calculated to lift your status. That is not <laughs> the song of humility of Christ. Christ was born in a manger. Peasant parents came as a slave servant, and he came to serve, not to be served. It's just in stark contrast to the philotimia, the honor of the Roman mindset. That's the culture Paul speaks into. That would be a tough culture to have them change, because that's what they grew up with. That's what they all knew. That's what their, the entire community held high. And in that community, he says, have your mind, have this mind among yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus. Jesus is the song of humility. But in verse 8, he continues with our second point, and that's the song of submission. In verse 8, it says, in being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Christ humbled himself. You know, sometimes uh, today our view of the cross probably doesn't, is not reflective. Uh, I, I had a, a, a picture and I, I chose not to show it. It's, it's so graphic, it probably is much more revealing of what the cross was like. But today we may have a cross on our in our jewelry, we may have a cross in our homes, even here at our church, we have a cross to remember Christ's death on the cross. When we talk about submission, let us understand what that was, was really like for him. Uh, in Matthew uh, 27, just let me just read a little bit of this to you. Uh, just before the cross, he was mocked. It says, uh, uh, the soldiers stripped him and put him in a scarlet robe on him, twisting together a, a crown of thorns they put it on his head and a reed put in his right hand. Kneeling before him, they mocked him. Picture what mocking might look like. Saying, hail to the king of the Jews, they spit on him and they took a reed and struck him on the head. If you wish to, there's a there's a, an illustration by uh, Nikola, Nikolai Guy, I believe it is. It's called the crucifixion. We picture Christ sometimes up on a cross. Our illustrations maybe maybe show him uh, quiet, maybe a maybe a halo over his head or something, some bright sunshine in the background. But that wasn't what people there experienced. It wasn't what he experienced, and it wasn't what the people saw. Often. Some say that uh, the, the, the cross is more like he, he carried a, the cross piece and they lifted him up on a post and hung him. And, and it may not be 18 feet high above everybody. It might be like six or eight feet and where people could come up and they could look him in the eye and they could spit on him and they could shame him and they could yell at him and they could whisper in his ear to make that experience as shameful as possible. And yet it says, in verse 8, he humbled himself by becoming obedient. Who, who would choose that? Who would choose that, that absolute shame? And yet Christ did. Lower himself to the lowest point for others and for you and for me. It's not just Christ, that Christ died. The point Paul is making is that he was following the leading of his Father by being obedient. Christ was obedient to what the Father asked of him. And yet he's, he even... Well, let me read this a little bit. In, as Christ saw this coming, 
It says, when Jesus uh, went with, with the disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to the disciples, sit here while I go over there and I pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and, and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Christ sang the song of submission, of obedience. Not my will, but your will. The song of submission is one that that we need to have singing through our minds, pushing out the song of pride, of looking good, of of, of being accepted and and looked well upon. How, Lord, your will, not mine, what do you wish me to do? How to use my time, how to use my position, how to use my personality, my temperament, my gifts, my position, my resources, my relationships. How in the service of God would you want me to to use me? Christ's ultimate act of obedience, the song of submission, is a song that we need to sing. And in the same way, say, Lord, your will, not mine. I will tell you, sometimes I wrestle with this. <laughs> if the dominant song of mine is that I'm in charge, I want to be in control, I want it to be my plan, my, I'm right, I won't apologize, I won't forgive, I will never, if those are the things that ring through my head, I will never learn the lyrics that Jesus modeled and reflected in the song of submission. I have to give up one to take on the other. Father, here is the cup, your will, not mine. There was a song of humility, there was a song of submission, and at the end there's a song of trust. And this is kind of picks up on that illustration I began at the be- I shared at the beginning where, where there's envy at somehow more than what I want, I want something more than you. And in a humorous way, I've been confronted with this with, with my kids. It started, first of all, with my son, Chris, whom I taught to golf, uh, who now mocks me when we golf. I may hit a solid drive out there, and Chris just looks over and says, I think I can fly that, and he does. And at the same time, I feel... I feel encouraged, this is my son, and this is a skill he's developed, and I have some, some encouraging pride that he has developed in this guy. There's part of me that says, no, I want to win. <laughs> and then it was just a few months ago, it dawned on me, and this is, this is kind of where it's not quite so funny, it's, it's true, it's kind of on that line. When I recognized that my three children, all married now, they make more money than I do. And somehow that didn't set well with me. I'm the father. Peg and I are the parents. And so on the one hand, I'm thrilled for them, but there's still a part of me, and I think it's that song of pride and envy that says, no, I'm the father. I, I don't... Do you get what I'm talking about? This is hard. It's not easy. And that can blow up if we don't turn and sing the song of humility and of trust. It can blow up into conversations and conflict. Even with the kids that I love and I'm proud of, it can. It's hard. (laughs) Let me share with you a verse over... um, 
in James. I'm just going to read it here. It's James chapter 4, verses 6 and verse 10. But he gives more grace. I could use that. He gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Let me read verses 10 and 11 for you. Oops. I'm glad I've got two of these. Helps me. Uh, Verses 10. This is the song of trust. So that at the name of Jesus, every name should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Christ took on humility. He took on submission, obedience. And he trusted God to be the one to elevate him. So that for this purpose, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of the Father, God exalts, he lifts up, he raises him, It's a song of trust. I obey the Father. I submit to His will, and He exalts. But if I'm caught up in that mindset of, I need to be the one who exalts myself. If I'm the one who has to look good and increase my status, even if it puts others down, that's not the song of trust. Listen to 1 Peter 2.23 says, While he was reviled, he did not revile in return. Speaking of Christ. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And that's probably where I, I really wrestle. It's that idea of giving up. You know, if you have a life where in part you're, tr- you're always trying to increase and grow in a healthy way, but also there's that part that wants to increase and grow in in status and in accomplishment, to feel good about myself in others' eyes. That's not what this passage is talking about. See, it's right here that the old song keeps playing in my mind. And it's a daily battle. <laughs> Everything, I, I look at things and I, I immediately, my mind goes to how will this pay off? What will I get? Is it worth giving this to get this? What am I going to get in return? But there's something about this that I long to. I'm, 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 I, I'm drawn to, I want to cling to. Because the, it gets tiring to always be trying to win, always trying to increase and look good. And the fear, the stress of not looking good in others' eyes is a terrible weight. But the song of trust says, I obey the Lord, I follow Him, I do what He asks me to do, I give as He chooses for me to give, and it's His part take care of the rest. And if I truly grasp this song of trust, it allows me just to to relax and not worry about all that and not try and make it on my own. It's a new song. Song of humility, a song of submission, a song of trust. I appreciated Maria's new song today. The line that says, the depth of my Redeemer's love for me. More than I can ever love myself, the depth of the, of the Savior's 
love for me, my Redeemer. If we go back and we contrast the Roman way and Christ's new song with the mindset that was Jesus, with the song that was Jesus, Rome said, you get in my way and I will crush you. And that was true of their army, and I think that was also true of the individuals. I will crush you. It's my goal to get above. And Jesus says, in contrast, I will be crushed for you as he gave his life. This message today was not to increase our knowledge of of Paul's message to the Philippians. It was not um, increase our, our familiarity with Paul's writings. This was not to increase and to, to wrestle with the, with the doctrine of Christology, although that, it's brought up here, and I know some of us want to go there, and, and it's worthy of our time. But Paul's message was one of Christ's humility. Speaking to the Philippians, live in a manner worthy of the gospel. <laughs> Have this mind, one, be, the, the, the mindset of one, oneness and of unity. Be of the same mind. How are you going to do that? <laughs> Let me give you an example. And he shares this song of humility, of submission, and of trust exemplified in Christ. This is a call for each of us to recognize that song of pride in, in our lives. It's a song we're born with. It's a song we wrestle with. It's the song that where there's any sort of, any degree of envy, if in any way it rang true that you'd rather have a, have a salary that's just a little bit more than others, or a tinge of frustration that other, everyone else would have a little bit more than you, that's not fair. That's envy. The idea of self-seeking, of, of, of being critical of others. Oh, I could have done it right this way, or, or they should have done this, or I don't know what they were thinking. And move into tr harsh criticism. If any of that rings true, it is a mindset that needs to be replaced. Let me re read for the, you again this mindset as, as laid out in, in Philippians chapter 2. In verse 4 it says, Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also into the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of the Father. That's a song that we should be singing every day. In fact, I'm going to ask you to do this. I'm going to ask you to read those, five, those verses from 5 to 11 once a day for the next week. I want you to be reminded of this new song. Have this mindset. That's what Paul was saying to the Philippians. Have this mindset. And here it is. He laid it out. And ask God to build into you this, that mindset, that song of Jesus. And replace the song of pride, of envy that still is part of us. That's what Paul said the answer was for them in Philippi. And that's what he says is the answer for us today. You see, Jesus is calling to us to sing this new song, a song of humility, a song of submission, and a song of trust. Would you pray with me? Oh, my Father, we come to you today and we just 
are so deeply indebted to our Lord Jesus Christ and the song he sang. We're indebted for Paul to put that into the letter of Philippians and for that to be kept for us to read today. That Paul's word describing the life of our Savior Jesus would challenge us to sing a new song, to be freed from the song of pride, of, of trying to win and gain and, and the stress of all that, and be freed as we humble ourselves, as we are obedient and submit to the Lord. Use me in your way, and that we trust that the Lord will lift us up as we obey him. Oh, the peace that that can bring to all of us, Father. The oneness that that can bring. So Lord, speak into our hearts. We want to read this over and over this week that we will truly grasp this new song and let it be our song. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Would you stand with us? I'm going to start with a song called Humble King.
thank you for this morning, the chance to hear your word, the chance to join together as a body of Christ, the chance to open these doors that all might enter in. Father, we are sinners in need of a Savior. We all come together to the foot of the cross, um, to a place where mercy reigns and will never die, a place where streams of grace come like a flood. Father, thank you for saving us. kids sing this song all the time. I love walking around the house and hearing them sing this song. 10,000 reasons to bless the Lord.
Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. Worship Your holy name. The sun. excited today is a promotion Sunday for the sixth graders heading upstairs so we're adding some new faces to the youth group this morning so if you have a, a sixth grader this year um, go on downstairs to start with they're gonna have a time with the the group downstairs and then they'll be coming up um, but just be praying we have had a, a wonderful season and it's just an amazing opportunity to stick around and minister to each other during Sunday school time smaller groups so please stick around we've got Sunday school for everybody but we'd like to dismiss the, the back rows first this morning. Let's do Bless the Lord one more time. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy